For some time now, I've been on a quest to replace my battered old 2015 MacBook Pro with a machine that, well, may not actually exist. The idea is straightforward. I want something that's as easy to handle as my Mac, but with enough horsepower to perform 4K video editing. And well, I also obviously want to play some games on it. Not necessarily the absolute state of the art at ultra settings, but hey, if that's available, why not? I've looked at six core Intel machines from MSI in the past. I've looked at the rather excellent but thermally challenged Dell XPS 13. And it's actually in the aftermath of that test that Intel came forward and essentially said, well, if you want workstation power, well, we've got an eight core 16 thread CPU that's been out for months now, the Core i9 9980HK. And here it is in the Dell XPS 15, the 9570 model. XPS line, pretty legendary at this point, and uh, the machine fits a number of my criteria for this mythical all-in-one replacement. And I've actually been using it for some months now. Back in March, did a fair amount of traveling and this was my go-to machine. Video encoding, editing, gaming, it has done the job. So let's quickly assess the spec here, the 9980HK. Well, as I said, eight cores, 16 threads. Power hungry, but battery life is pretty good in this machine owing to a ginormous 97 watt hour battery. And it does have a dedicated GPU, but owing to the form factor, not an especially inspiring one. The GTX 1650 with four gigs of GDDR5. 1650, pretty much the weakest Turing based GPU in Nvidia's lineup. But as we shall discover, it is capable of some fairly decent results in its own right. Memory, this machine came with 16 gigs of DDR4 running at 2666 megahertz. Storage was taken care of with a 512 gig SSD. The screen, 4K non-OLED touchscreen. Resolution is great. Color reproduction is insanely vibrant to the point where it does actually need adjusting. And while motion handling is okay for productivity, this is clearly not a gaming screen. The ghosting, pretty self-evident there. I know you're super keen on seeing how this thing performs, but really the build quality and the form factor of the XPS has always been its strong point. Weighs less than two kilos and it's thin. 17 millimeters tapering down to just 11. Ports are fairly limited, but get the job done. USB 3, USB-C with Thunderbolt 3, HDMI 2.0, headphone jack. That's what you get on the left side. On the right, you've got the Kensington lock, another USB port, plus the SD card slot. Keyboard, absolutely fine, perhaps a little too clicky for my liking, and I found the trackpad to be somewhat overreactive in processing gestures I never actually made. I got used to it, but it took time. Oh yeah, and the webcam. Dell's ill-advised foray into weird camera positioning is over, and it's exactly where it should be. I will talk about my experiences in using this machine as a workstation, but to begin with, well, fundamentally, Digital Foundry is a game-centric channel, and the basic perception is that NVIDIA's GTX 1650, possibly too anemic to be worthwhile, even for 1080p gaming. So you see, I do have a problem with that because fundamentally PC games are designed to be scalable. Are there faster GPUs on the market? Absolutely. Are there laptops on uh, the market with better thermals than the XPS? Undoubtedly, but consider this. GTX 1650 has tons more rendering power than the current gen consoles. So it stands to reason that you'll be able to exceed the output of say, PlayStation 4, if you feed it broadly equivalent workloads. And let's not forget, Today's games are built primarily with PS4 in mind. It is the market leader after all. But what I will say is that I did encounter issues with CPU performance, specifically in terms of clock speeds. GTX 1650 should boost in excess of 1.8 gigahertz, sometimes even higher, but sometimes I noted some obvious performance drops here, some really obvious stutter. But as I said, I think this is actually a problem with CPU turbo pulling back for some reason and bottlenecking the entire system. Using Reva Tuner to monitor, CPU clocks seem to adjust up and down radically, and this really isn't great for gaming. But I could get rid of it. And I did so by dipping into a third party tool called Throttle Stop and turning off Intel's Turbo Boost. This limits all eight cores and 16 threads on the CPU to just 2.4 gigahertz. Now this is still plenty of horsepower for most gaming scenarios and crucially, I never saw any lurches in GPU clocks again. 
I reckon that if you manually set the clock multiplier higher, you could probably achieve similar stability and eke out more CPU performance. But still, that's what I did for the purposes of this test and it achieved what I wanted. And yeah, in the case of the XPS 15 here, I double checked the benchmarks and found that the mobile version here is matching the desktop one point for point. Anyway, as you all probably know by now, when it comes to gameplay testing, I always use Crisis 3 as my go-to example to get a grip on general performance. Very high setting here, but shading and shadows have dropped to high. This is how you enjoy close to max fidelity while saving a ton of GPU power. And well, by and large, it works. No need for 30 FPS caps here or whatever. You're at 60 FPS for most of the time. Not all of the time though. Interestingly, while the jungle stage plays out really nicely, the first stage exhibits some issues uh, which do seem to be bandwidth related. Of course, there's far more scalability in this game, but I am running this at close to max settings at 1080p, uh, but I did so merely to set the stage for further testing. So remember when I talked about using console as a baseline and scaling up from there? Well, there are some scenarios where the GTX 1650 actually manages to run a hell of a lot better. Battlefield 5, for example, is essentially running at medium-ish settings on console, and while the PS4 hits 1080p, uh, there's some evidence that it's kind of doing it with some kind of image reconstruction technique. Uh, XPS 15 with GTX 1650, well, this was really simple to run with great performance. Simply select 1080p, native 1080p, high settings, and you're good to go. You're not an ultra, but the fidelity is still excellent, and there are many games you can enjoy with no real issue on what is effectively a fairly weak GPU, relatively speaking. Operating in conditions where it may well be subject to being thermally limited or perhaps power limited. But, you know, here we are, dangerous driving from Three Fields Entertainment. 30 FPS on the base consoles, but here we are getting a mostly locked 60 frames per second on the GTX 1650 at epic settings. Just an example of how some games, seemingly UE4 ones, do seem to prefer running on PC generally. Now we do get some drops here in takedowns and some very occasional stutter, but not enough to have any kind of undue impact on enjoying the game. And here's another interesting example. Wolfenstein Youngblood. It absolutely flies on Nvidia's Turing architecture, and here at high settings, the game is basically locked to 60 frames per second with VSync in place throughout the entire duration. This is an interesting one actually because the game supports VRS, variable rate shading, and while the non-RTX Turing cards, like the GTX 1650, are missing a lot of next-gen rendering features, ray tracing and whatnot, VRS works great and gives you another little boost to performance here. High settings, um, this is indeed generally superior to the console experience. So, some might say that the games tested here may not be a particularly taxing workout for the GTX 1650. So, I'm going to round off the game analysis tests here with a title that's well known for being particularly taxing, Remedies Control. Let's remember that this one is effectively rendering at 720p on Xbox One, 900p on PS4, 1080p on the Pro, 1440p on Xbox One X. First of all, I don't really like inconsistent performance in my gaming, and I certainly don't like constant screen tearing with VSync off. I think there's a strong argument now for any and all premium laptop to ship with some kind of VRR technology, which the XPS 15 doesn't have. So while 1080p control on medium slash high settings, seemingly pretty good performance here, it feels bad. Feels to me bad anyway. So if I can't get 60 frames per second, uh, or something close to it with some level of consistency, capping frame rate to 30 with VSync on is my preferred option over wobbly performance like this. But doing so usually comes with improper frame pacing, as you can see here. We're getting 30 frames per second, but it's not an even 33.3 millisecond per frame. Now my usual strategy here is to use the NVIDIA control panel to engage half rate adaptive sync. And this does generally give you a proper 30 FPS on a 60 Hertz screen with consistent frame pacing. But because this is using NVIDIA Optimus technology, which switches between the discrete GPU and the Intel integrated one, doesn't seem to be an option here anymore, which is annoying. Do not fear though, the third party NVIDIA Inspector has its own 30 FPS cap option and this does indeed respect proper frame pacing. So as you can see in control here, we're good to go. 
I ended up using a mixture of medium settings with high object LOD, high texture filtering, and well, there you go. An NVIDIA GTX 1650 running control at 1080p 30, kind of broadly similar to the output of the PS4 Pro actually. So let's round off the GPU discussion. At launch in desktop form, the 1650 was roundly dismissed because, well, essentially the Radeon RX 570 was around and it was a ton faster. But in the laptop space, the strengths of the 1650, power consumption, thermals, they mean everything and we get a good experience. Now it's not amazing, it's not whack everything up to ultra and away you go kind of thing. You do need to tinker, you do need to accept that you're not using the best of the best, but certainly the ability to play AAA games with better than console results is a pleasant experience overall. I am a bit concerned that I had to throttle back the CPU though. Either it's a power management thing or it just gets too hot in there. And I suspect it is power. But for this machine, it's the CPU that intrigues me the most because eight cores, 16 threads in a laptop. Well, we have new Ryzen mobile chips coming and I'm hopefully looking at one of those very soon. Um, but fundamentally, that amount of horsepower does solve the video editing challenge I have. So here I'm scrubbing around the timeline of the Xbox Series X construction video I put together recently. This video was mastered at 1080p, but all of the component assets from the filmed stuff of me speaking to the location shots at the Microsoft HQ, that all 4K. And it's actually useful for us to shoot at 4K, then downscale to 1080p because we can pan, we can zoom, all manner of interesting options there really. Um, so yeah, I edited this on my main workstation and imported the whole 400 gigabyte project over to the XPS. Now exporting this project, that's the challenge. The video is around 15 minutes total. First of all, I export to ProRes, a broadcast quality version of the edit that we then re-encode using Handbrake into H.264 and HEVC. These are the codecs that we use for YouTube, but also as high-end encodes for download by our Patreon supporters. I noted under extreme workloads, CPU throttles back to 2.8 to 2.9 gigahertz, while under lighter workloads, it generally hits around 3 to 3.3. So yeah, closer to base clock than the advertised boost, but there we are. I'm not gonna make the comparison easy either, as I'm gonna compare the results from this laptop to my recently constructed super high-end desktop workstation. This has a core i9, 10980XE 80 core CPU, Titan RTX, and 32 gigs of 3200 MHz DDR4. Premiere Pro export took the XPS 15, 28 minutes, 53 seconds. And this uses a combination of CPU and GPU. So not surprisingly, my workstation did it much quicker at 14 minutes 30. Now remember, I'm using pretty much the best $1,000 CPU here and a stupendously expensive GPU on top of that. But, you know, in that context, I think the laptop does pretty well, I think. Basically half the performance for a fully portable solution. I think that'll do pretty nicely. So what about encoding that ProRes output to H.264 and HEVC? There's no GPU involvement here, it's full on CPU. I achieved average encoding speeds at H.264 of 42.8 FPS on the XPS 15, up against 100.2 on the 10980XE workstation. HEVC encoding though, this is insanely taxing on CPU. And there we see a result of 34 frames per second from the laptop up against the 69.8 on the workstation. Obviously there is a compromise there then, but when you consider the fact that we're dropping from 18 cores down to 8, and losing a decent chunk of clock speed too. Well, I'd say that the 9980HK is doing okay. And it kind of illustrates that real life workloads can be worlds away from synthetic benchmarks. I could definitely work on this thing for sure for my video editing, but the lack of VRAM on the GPU could be a problem for actual 4K video projects, particularly when using insane memory intensive transitions like this one. So there we go, the XPS 15. The chassis is pretty old at this point. A new version is in development. And of course, Intel is on the point of releasing new Comet Lake variants of the very same processor that's found in this machine. Improved thermals and an updated CPU architecture will likely produce much better results. Even so, bearing in mind how extremely powerful my desktop workstation is and how wide the gap is in terms of raw specs, the fact that I have this much power in a much, much smaller form factor is pretty impressive. 
So yeah, I'm going to be really fascinated to see how those Ryzen 4000 Renoir chips stack up. My Premiere and video encoding tests are repeatable after all. So look, we've got innovation here in the laptop CPU space coming up, but the GTX 1650 isn't going anywhere. It will remain the entry level mobile Turing solution. And I have to say that bearing in mind it's less than stellar reputation as a desktop part, definitely does a job in the mobile arena. I'd quite happily play a bunch of demanding games on it. And indeed I did. Anyway, that's all from me for now. Liking, subscribing, sharing, that's all very useful in supporting the work we do here at Digital Foundry, as is ringing the notification bell for, well, instant notifications when we post new content. And of course, for those that love what we do, the DF Patreon is there for supporting myself and the team more directly. And to sweeten the deal, you'll get pristine quality video downloads of everything we do, with content online there stretching all the way back to the launch of the PS4 Pro way back in 2016. Anyway, that's all from me for now. Thanks for watching and indeed supporting Digital Foundry.